So welcome, I'm Emma Ridgway, I'm Head of Programme here at Modern Art Oxford, and we're extremely excited about the event this evening. It's um, part of the programme of Alexandra Mir's Space Tapestry, which is, she's got two large parts of, a huge drawing upstairs in the galleries called Earth Observation and Human Space Flight. And as part of creating this work, it involved a lot of generosity and conversations with some of the lead exciting science innovators around the UK space industry. And thanks to Alexandra, myself and curator Sarah Lowes, who's wonderful and over there, met with Matha Eustatard at Airbus in Stevenage. And we saw machines and technologies we didn't know existed. And we got to walk on the moon landscape and see the rover being tested out. And it was completely extraordinary. And you can read about it in this book which has got conversations that Alexandra had as research for this extraordinary project of her space tapestry, um, which she's worked very closely with our curator here, Stephanie Strain, on as well. Uh, and we are very grateful to the UK Space Agency and Arts Council England, who've made this all possibly possible. Uh, so Space Tapestry is a really wonderful project. It's about how we visually represent space. And Alexandra's got really inspiring ambitions for this project. So it's visual stories that she's interested that are based in reality. So they're not fictional, imaginary ideas. She's interested in art's role in depicting human endeavor. And we are very excited to have Matthew here to share his extraordinary knowledge of this field. So I'm delighted to introduce Matthew Stuttard, who has joined what is now Airbus in 2006 and he is currently Advanced Concepts Architect for Space Systems in the UK. One of the conversations we had in Stevenage was Alexandra pointing out that he has possibly the best job titles ever. Um, because before he was Advanced Concept Architect for Space Systems in the UK, until 2013, he was Head of Future Programmes in Science and Planetary Exploration. And his titles are only half as cool as the work he does. And before Airbus, he worked at for Logica, which is now called CGI, and he's worked for over 20 years in satellite imaging applications and geospatial information systems. And if you're wondering, like I was, where do you even get, how do you get started in this? He did his first degree in geography. Uh, today, he's concerned with uh, bringing new types of space systems into reality, and the futurescapes timeframes he looks at are between five and 10 years ahead, and they're on a big range of topics. So from space weather to radiation shielding, space debris, radar applications, and new satellite telecoms architecture for the Internet of Things. So it's time we let him do his thing. He's going to speak for about 50 minutes and then do ask questions, including difficult ones. Right, right well, thanks. Thanks very much. That was a great introduction. Um, and it's really a great pleasure to be here. Thanks for coming along this evening. I really appreciate it. Um, the talk is entitled Space for Humans, and it's really about human perception of space. Uh, and as part of that, I'm actually going to be showing you a lot of very attractive, to my mind, imagery and talking about that. But before we get on to the pretty pictures, I want to spend a few minutes talking about the importance of satellites in our daily life, uh, which is, you know, the importance of space, space for humans in our daily life. So, uh, well, you've heard I work for Airbus. You've probably flown on one of the products <coughs> once or twice a year, but there is something that you use every day that we also make, and that is satellites. Okay, you use satellites far more often than you go on a plane. So what's a satellite? Well. This is one. Uh, the moon is a satellite of Earth. A satellite is a smaller body that orbits around a larger body, quite simply, using the force of gravity. Um, I took this picture of the moon in the back garden, actually. It's quite easy to take a good picture of the moon. You need a telephoto lens and a tripod, and it's relatively easy to get a great picture of the moon. You don't need a fancy telescope, and it's quite a beautiful object. But... Um, I don't know, it's also a bit barren and dusty as well, isn't it? Um, something that isn't barren and dusty 
is the Earth, and the Earth is a satellite of the Sun. It takes one year and a bit, 365 days and a bit, to get around the Sun, so it's orbiting the Sun. It's a satellite, and of course it's the most important satellite that we know of, because without it we simply wouldn't be here. It's a truism. Oh, excuse me, I've gone too far. Right, so my talk is not about natural satellites, it's about artificial satellites like this one. It's called Meteosat. You get a sense of it being quite big there. And we've got these standard height engineers that you can judge the height of it from. And um, uh, Meteosat is a weather satellite. So this is used to take weather pictures which are used to improve weather forecasts. It's quite a big satellite because it goes a very long way from Earth, 35,000 kilometres. And it orbits the Earth in one day, so it's always looking at the same part of the Earth. It's above the equator, a long way away. It takes exactly one Earth day to go around the Earth, so therefore, if you're looking at it, it doesn't appear to move in the sky. And if you're on the satellite, looking down at the Earth, this is what you would see in one day. This is a time lapse of one day from a Meteosat satellite. And just to orient, you've got the night coming across here, this is India, this is Africa, this is Saudi Arabia, the Arabian Gulf, Indian Ocean. What you really see here, though, are these huge weather systems that are bubbling up, moving across, across the Himalayas over here. You can see them coming across and going out into Tibet and China. And over here, over Europe, you see weather systems developing. Weather forecasters get a lot of quantitative information from this, the temperatures of the clouds, how fast they're moving, where they are in the atmosphere, how high they are, and from that they've been able to improve weather forecasts. So you may not believe it, but weather forecasts are actually getting better, and more than 50% of what weather forecasters call forecast skill comes from satellite images, not just this sort, but various satellite data. <coughs> now, Another application is satellite communications. Who's got one of these on their roof? I don't mean two small boys. Who's got a satellite dish? Anybody? Nobody? Yes, you've got a satellite dish. Right, OK. So this satellite dish is fixed down firmly with rocks so that it doesn't blow away. The reason I've shown this one is because it's in the foothills of the Himalayas. And... Um, there, they can't get TV using a normal aerial because they're too deep in the valleys. So you see satellite dishes all over uh, quite developing countries where it's quite difficult to get TV signals. But they'll have a, a battered old satellite dish that will still work perfectly well. And what it's pointing at is another geostationary satellite, again, a long way away from the Earth, orbiting once a day, fixed point in the sky. So it can be held down with rocks. It's always pointing at the satellite. And uh, it, it will look something like this. This is one of our radio communication satellites <coughs> in a clean room uh, in, uh, in the UK. And these are big antennas that are, would, in space will be beaming down TV signals to that dish and lots of dishes around. So you can get TV broadcast from a, from a system like this. You, also, it's used, of course, for two-way satellite communications, ship to shore, things like that. Um, this room's rather fancy, isn't it? It's, we, our interior designers did a great job on it. Um, but in fact, these, these um, coverings are to make it radio quiet. That's why this spiky stuff is on the wall. But I think it looks, yeah, it looks rather, rather interesting, if not attractive. attractive. Something else uh, that you use. If you've got a smartphone, you've got a space-connected system in your pocket that is all the time talking to or receiving signals from at least four satellites, all the time. Because when you get the map thing out and there's that little blue dot, the position of that dot is being worked out by satellite information coming to your phone directly. So that's a satellite navigation system. These satellites are whizzing around the Earth at 20,000 kilometres, uh, like bees around a hive. And uh, as long as you can, your system can see, your phone can see four of them over the horizon at any one time, it can work out very precisely your location to within metres. 
There are lots and lots of other applications of satellite navigation. Don't have time for that. I want to get onto the pretty pictures. And there are lots of other applications of space. <coughs> so you've used space today. I've used space today. It's threaded into our lives, completely woven into our lives. But it's an invisible technology. And that's something that isn't in our consciousness, that space is something we use every day not just for weather forecasting, for communications, for sat-nav on your phone, but also these other things. And seeing what is happening on Earth, so monitoring climate change, looking at, <coughs> at the polar ice caps and how they are changing, looking at deforestation, responding to um, natural disasters. So first response, when there's some natural disaster, a tsunami, an earthquake or something like that, all the maps are out of date. The rescue people need to know which roads are passable, which bridges are up and so on. Satellite images can be taken within hours of an event happening and provide that kind of information to first responders. So the great thing about artificial satellites isn't just that they do these things, but you can do them by other techniques, air, aircraft and so on, but satellites do it anywhere around the world. That's the really big difference. And then there's another application I haven't mentioned, which is make scientific discoveries. And I'm going to show you some pictures linked to the science satellites that are either looking out from Earth at the planets, at the stars, at the universe, or in towards Earth, looking at how the Earth works. So, Coming on to the aesthetics part of the talk, I started with satellites, so I'm making a statement that satellites are not aesthetically pleasing objects, and I'll show you some ugly ones in a moment, but I want to start with the first satellite ever, which was this one, it was 60 years ago this year, Sputnik was launched. I think it's an absolutely beautiful object. Uh, it kicked off the space age, it started the uh, space race between the Soviet Union and the USA and led to the moon landings and to Yuri Gagarin being the first man into orbit around the Earth and shortly after Tereshkova being the first woman into orbit around the Earth. Sputnik had a battery, it was about this size, that sphere about this size, had a battery inside and a radio transmitter and these things sticking out from it are the aerials for the radio transmitter. When it was transmitting, you could tune into it. Amateur people, amateur radio folk, anyone with a radio could actually tune into Sputnik and hear it. So then Radio Sputnik sounded like, uh, like this. That's all it did, right? Actually, you could do quite a lot of science with that signal. I won't say any more about that. but. Um, that's all it did, but it was like an internet meltdown. The newspapers went crazy around the world when Sputnik was launched, particularly in the US, because it showed that those Soviets were up to something. And it also sent a very powerful message that they could send something to fly over Soviet territory, of course, so there's that part of it as well. So it really had a galvanic effect on the whole world, and we forget how, what a big thing that was, the first artificial satellite in orbit around the Earth. So, rolling forward um, 60 years, there are now 1,500 operational satellites in orbit around the Earth at the moment, doing all sorts of different things, and here's four particularly ugly telecommunications satellites, um, and just to show that it's not really a cultural thing, uh, this is one of ours, this is an Airbus-built one, this is one built, I think, by Boeing. It's a US one. Uh, this is a Soviet, uh, oh, sorry, so this is a Russian one. And this is a Chinese one. It's not a very good picture of the Chinese one because they don't give us the pictures, but there you go. Um, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> my contention is that uh, it, it, as far as these satellites are concerned, they are built to do a job, not to be admired. So form follows function. And you can draw a direct comparison with a, a Land Rover uh, versus a Tesla uh, racing car, uh, sports car. So form follows function. Except this is a bracket 
uh, that we've put on scores of our telecommunication satellites, quite small. Its job is to hold um, an antenna in a very firm position and to survive launch. It has to be strong and stable, not weak and wobbly, right? And um, it's quite heavy, it's quite difficult to make, has many piece parts, has to be fitted together. And recently, we've developed a new way of making this same function. The bracket has to have holes here and here and holes here and here. And what it does in the middle has got to be just strong. So we've made this with a 3D printing in metal. And this is a 3D printed bracket. And you see these beautiful lines on it. And not because, you know, we suddenly got all, oh, wouldn't it be nice if it was a nice shape? Because it's all hidden inside, covered up with insulating foil. You can't see this thing, but it's that shape because it has to be. These are the strain lines exactly. So it's thicker where it needs to be thick and thinner to save mass, because that's really important on a satellite, keep things light. It's thinner uh, where it doesn't need mass. So these are exactly the strain paths by doing a complex analysis. And this is what it looks like when it's 3D printed. And this is what it looks like in reality. So do pass that around and admire this wonderful, wonderful object that is, is not art, but it looks like art. It's absolutely fabulous. And that is made, it's worth a lot of money, so you could probably drop it. It's incredibly strong, but uh, please don't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right, I'm going to move on now. Um, Let's move on from satellites and hardware to images and what makes an image beautiful. Now, I may be an expert in spacey things, but I'm not really an expert in aesthetics. So rather than uh, tell you who know more about aesthetics than I do uh, what, uh, what makes an image beautiful, I decided to use public opinion. And of course, we know how reliable public opinion is. Uh, Shutterstock, it's a photo um, agency website, they did an analysis of the top 10 Instagram pictures and drew out from those pictures the common elements which are listed here. Now you could probably argue about all of this, but I just thought for context, let's have a look at some pictures from space and then we can come back to this. First of all though, just to explain something, I'm going to get a little bit technical in a moment, but to help with that, here are three uh, self-portraits, Rembrandt, Van Gogh and Picasso at 90. And they're all using <coughs> colour, form, texture on the paper uh, in order to not just convey their self-portrait, but to convey something that we cannot see, which is their emotional state. And I think this comes across you know, very, very strongly in all of these pictures, the emotional state of the artist at the time of creating the picture. So what I'm trying to say is that we can use, pictures can be used to show things we cannot see. It's the same with some of the pictures I'm going to show you because a lot of the sensors on board satellites, uh, which are looking into space or looking down at the Earth, are sensing invisible light and you can then show a natural colour picture that our eyes understand because they sense invisible light. But there's a whole other part of the electromagnetic spectrum right from gamma rays to radio rays that we can't see but we can sense and we can take pictures of. So if you've got an infrared telescope or you take a microwave imaging picture, how are you going to show that? You can't show microwaves on a, on a screen but you can represent them visible light that our eyes then understand. So some of the pictures I'm going to show you are in true colour, what our eyes would see, more or less, uh, and some of them are in false colour. So um, just so you have, keep that in your mind as we go through. Let's start then with beauty in space. And everything I'm going to show you is real images. None of it is computer graphics of any sort. Really important point because some of it is absolutely astonishing. This was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope, a very famous uh, telescope, <coughs> and it's the Eagle Nebula, which is an area of hydrogen gas and dust uh, a very long way away, um, 14,000 light years away. And 
a more recent picture was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope of that central part called the Pillars of Creation, taken with a better camera with a longer exposure because the Hubble's been improved in its lifetime. And I just love this picture, this, this veil of dust here, uh, which is being eroded off from the main cloud by nearby stars. The ultraviolet radiation is blowing off this. Now, it's important to understand the scale of this. This is eight light years across. <laughs> now, we're eight light minutes from the sun, OK? Eight light minutes, OK? So you see these little fingers up here? You could fit the whole of the solar system in one of those fingers. Just sense of scale. Anyway, it's a beautiful image. And it's created not in true colour. Some of it is visible light, but some of it is infrared light that we couldn't see. Now, here is a thermal infrared image of the same area. Here are the pillars of creation again. And I'm not going to talk about the technicalities of this image. It's just fantastic. It's like a Turner, isn't it? Turner's storm or something. Or if you go into a basilica in Rome and you look up at the dome and some Renaissance artist has painted God descending from the firmament, you could have God sort of coming out of there, couldn't you? It would look absolutely fine. <laughs> but it's a con trick. All of those images there, these astronomical images, look fabulously colourful and, and attractive. If you are ever lucky enough to look through a powerful space telescope, this is what you'll see. It's dull, it's grey, it's dark, and it's not in colour. And I'm afraid space is not colourful to our eyes. It's only because of looking at things at different wavelengths and putting them together with some fancy image processing that astronomers have conned us into thinking that space is incredibly colourful. They have to do it to get the funding for their great big ta space telescopes. Let's be honest, it's a public relations exercise to make space look sexy. This is really what it looks like. And there's a fantastic nebula in here called the Elephant's Trunk Nebula. You probably haven't even noticed it. But if you took that with a few different filters and jazzed it up, you could make that look absolutely fantastic as well. But that's what this looks like through a, an, an amateur, but very good amateur astronomical telescope, that space. Right, so space is dull and boring and not very beautiful, <laughs> is what I'm saying, really, in its essence. How about the planets? Well. Uh, this is every round object in the solar system to scale, apart from the sun. Um, so, here's, here's the Earth, <coughs> here's Jupiter, here's Mars, here are the moons of, Mars, uh, of Jupiter. Um, I'm going to show you a few pictures of some of these. don't have time to show you pictures of all of the planets. I'm going to concentrate on the ones that have got the greatest variation and interest uh, visually. Uh, one thing I just want you to understand, sense of scale, look at the Earth and look at this here. This is called the Great Red Spot. So that's Great Red Spot is bigger than the Earth. I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, the other thing about Jupiter is this was taken. These are real colour images, OK, true colour. This is what, what you would see if you were whizzing past these objects. And this one was, was taken. Um, by Voyager, which has uh, been flying through space for, for decades. And Voyager and every probe that's been to Jupiter hasn't ever seen this part until a couple of months ago. This is the North Pole of Jupiter. This is the North Pole of Jupiter by a mission called Juno, and this was taken only about two months ago. So you're seeing something that all of humanity before us has never seen before and very few people have actually seen this so you know you're you're amongst a, a few a few thousands of people who've seen this sort of image and i i can't help thinking this looks like um picasso's eyes <laughs> but there you go these 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 are not quite true colors but it's close to true color uh, it's, I, I won't explain any more than that, because time will tick on if I do. Um, and it, it, what is it? Let me explain that with the next picture. Well, let's get back to the Great Red Spot. 
Now, Jupiter is mainly composed of hydrogen gas, but it has some traces of ammonia and sulphites and so on. If it was all hydrogen, it's a fatal star. It's a star that never ignited, right? Because it, um, it wasn't, didn't get big enough to, to, for fusion to start, for the fusion reaction to, to light the nuclear reactor inside the star. So Jupiter is a failed star. Uh, but um, it's got this weather system, and this great, this great red spot is an example of a weather system. It's like a massive storm, so it's a gas storm, like we have hurricanes on Earth. This is like a hurricane that's been whizzing around Jupiter for hundreds and hundreds of years. It's always been there since we've had telescopes to look at it. It changes a bit, but the great red spot is always there. And then you get these fantastic turbulent wake forms. And the reason why it's coloured is because ammonia and other uh, 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 chemicals, chemical gases, come up through the atmosphere, interact with the sunlight, and then you get this colouring effect. Um, and it's just a beautiful image. There's one thing here, which is the moon of Jupiter, called Europa. Now, Europa is an icy moon. Our moon's a rocky moon. Here's a picture of Europa, uh, taken by a spacecraft called Galileo uh, about 20 years ago. And this area here is magnified here. Europa has got a, an ice crust, and inside we think there's liquid water, because as it orbits Jupiter, the tidal of Jupiter's gravity causes friction stirring inside Europa. It warms up and it melts the icy uh, interior of Jupiter. Not the surface, because it's so cold, the surface stays frozen, but the interior gets warm enough to melt. And occasionally, events happen which cause cracking on the surface and the water underneath comes out. And you get this fantastic cracking effects from different events. You can see how this one is underneath that one, okay, because at this junction here you can see that's on top. So there's this really complicated sort of pick-up sticks effect of all of these cracks on the surface of Europa. This again is not true colour, I uh, must stress that. This has been, colours have been assigned to different kinds of surface material on, on, in this picture. I'm moving on now to Mars very quickly to make the point. Mars is known as the red planet. That's because it's rusty. This is iron oxide on the surface of Mars, which is red. Rust is red. And um, the ice caps here are carbon dioxide and water. There isn't any liquid water on Mars. There was liquid water on Mars. Mars doesn't have a magnetic field. And because of that, the solar wind blew off all the water. It's got a very thin carbon dioxide atmosphere, but there is no longer liquid water, uh, of any duration at least, on the surface of Mars. So it's a barren, dusty planet. There is, as far as we know, no life there at the moment. Now we're going to send a rover there in 2020 to see if there is evidence of past life buried beneath the surface, because the surface has been sterilised by ultraviolet light from the sun and the atmosphere isn't sufficient to protect the surface from UV. It's still quite beautiful. This is, this is a picture of a crater from the Mars Express uh, satellite, uh, which has been orbiting Mars now for oh, 10 years, more than 10 years. Um, so this is, this is rather interesting. There's a lot of interpretation you can do on this. So something hit Mars, created this quite large crater. It's gradually filled in with dust which is why this looks rounded and soft inside. And then there was a volcanic event which led to a crack appearing right across the middle of that crater. There are lots of wonderful pictures of the surface of Mars, including ones that have been taken from rovers on the surface. But my contention is it's a really barren planet with very repetitive sort of landscapes, not a lot of variation to it, though you can find. And I could show you lots of wow pictures of Mars, but I really want to move on to, um, to this, the Earth. <clears throat> now, this isn't perhaps a beautiful picture. It needs a bit of explanation. This is called Earthrise. It's an incredibly famous picture in space world because uh, 
Apollo 8 was the first time that humans came out to the moon and orbited around the moon and then came back to Earth. When Apollo 8 was going out to the moon, there was no rear view mirror, okay? They couldn't see behind them. When they went around the moon and were coming back for the first time, they saw Earth hanging in space like that. And then this dusty, barren moon here. So it's called Earthrise over the moon. And Bill Anders, who was on that mission, famously said, we came all this way to study the moon and learn about it. And what we really discovered was the Earth. So I'd like you now to hold your thumb up against the Earth and see if you can cover it. Come on, see if you can cover it. Because this is the thing that all of the Apollo astronauts did. And why? It was called the Blue Marble. I'll just let you read that. So I think my point is that um, really the most beautiful thing in space is the Earth. And to emphasise that, I'm now going to show you a bunch of wonderful pictures, very quickly, uh, of the Earth. And this is Antarctica. Um, could talk for ages about this. Um, it, it pulsates. There's very little tonal variation in it. And the, the, the palette is very limited. But in a way, it's almost like a Rothko, this very limited palette, and it kind of buzzes at you. And then, if you pan across it, you get this slash across it, like a Lucio Fontana slash canvas. And then if you zoom into it, you can't quite zoom in far enough, but if you look carefully at that, you can make out that this is an Arctic truck convoy on an ice road. And here is the previous ice road, and here's the previous ice road, and here's the previous ice road. And he's staying in the Arctic. This is home bay in Antarctica. This is the edge of an ice sheet. Glaciers are carving off the ice sheet, making this amazing bubbly texture here. Then they carve off into the sea. And here are, here are icebergs in the sea. And the reason why it looks this strange 3D effect, the more you look at this, the more kind of 3D it becomes. If you really stare at it, it'll stomp out at you like 3D. That's because the sun is very low, and these are the shadows. These are all the shadows of the icebergs. Actually, if you knew the time and the date, you could work out the height of each of these icebergs, and from that you could measure the mass, but that's by the by. So you don't want to hear about that techie stuff, do you? It's just beautiful. And I like the contrast as well between this sort of chaotic and this smooth icing of the ice sheet. We'll stay with ice, but here interacting with rock. And this is Glacier Bay in Alaska. And I just think this looks like the best brushstroke in the world. Moving on to sand, this is Al Humra in the United Arab Emirates. If you've been to the UAE, you'll know that there's down over here off the image along the coast, there's a massive amount of development, but the desert is undeveloped. You can make out uh, two roads here. And this is the effect of wind on sand. So you're seeing dunes, these are Balkan dunes. And then these larger structures, they look like Islamic calligraphy to my eye. They're really beautiful shapes, wind-blown sand. More sand, this time in Saudi Arabia. Fantastic patterns in the sand. And this colour here is false colour. The sand is not this sulphurous yellow colour, OK? It's been image processed to look like that because this picture is trying also to show something else, which is over here. Those amazing dots are centre pivot irrigation horticulture. These are some hundreds of metres across and in the middle of each 
is a standpipe effectively and then a very long hose pipe on wheels that's going around in a circle automatically watering to produce crops. And this is the first image I've shown you which has got vegetation and human influence properly in the image and we'll sh show some more of them as we go through. So um, again I love the contrast of the dots I'm not going to say Damien Hurst but oh damn I did uh, 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 with the natural structures that you see in the in the image on the right or the part of the image on the right and then you've also got this interesting area of dry valleys these river valleys with no water in them. The reason why it's shown in red is because the vegetation in there ref is reflecting very strongly in a part of the spectrum called the near infrared which is just outside what we can see but what insects can see so that's why bees are attracted to certain flowers that we might think they're boring because they're seeing them like wow in the near infrared. Um, so to show near infrared in this picture all the colours have been shifted so near infrared is shown in red, <coughs> red is shown in green and green is shown in blue, sorry am I confusing you but anyway, so that's why the, the sand doesn't look uh, realistic, but it's a false colour. This is in the Sahara Desert, Taman Rasset in Algeria. Fantastic rock structure. So this is about the interaction of rock and water and also what happens to rock. The rock in this image has been is sedimentary rock that's been pushed upwards into a dome and then the top of it has been eroded off flat. So if you take an onion and you cut the top of an onion off, you see rings. So these are it's exactly the same sort of thing. These are rings of different sediments, rock sediments, which in the centre, you know, you've got this perfect oval shape. And then all of these are different coloured rocks with uh, different kind of stream patterns on them. A little bit more vegetation, this is the Gobi Desert uh, <coughs> in Mongolia. Tibetan Plateau up here, very very dry and barren but on the edge you've got vegetation and it's semi-desert here and this looks to me like watercolour wash. Going full colour now, full false colour, this is the Gibson Desert in Australia and a very special image processing technique has been used. I won't say it because it sounds too mind-boggling. Um, but it's sh what it's showing here is the different geology, which is um, different iron content in the rock. Um, and this shows up very well with a certain sort of image processing. But the colour is very false. Right? But you can see the rock structures, these, these stripes underneath, which adds to the image a great deal. If it was just blocks of colour, it wouldn't look the same. You've got this additional uh, folding and shading, which really adds to it. Uh, it looks a bit, is it fauvist? Is that the sort of word you might apply? For you? I don't know. I'm not an art expert. This is called Lake Disappointment. It's in Australia as well. So this is the interaction of a lot of water and rock together. And what a fantastic combination. I'm not going to analyse it much more. I just like looking at it. Uh, it's great that it's called late disappointment because it's not at all disappointing to look at from space. Oh, and by the way, I forgot to say, all of these images are taken from um, about 800 kilometres up, so 500 miles. Okay. Uh, this is the Senegal River in West Africa, meandering. This is the main flow of it here. You start to see fields here showing, again, false colour, red for vegetation lots of fields and the other thing you can see is is oxbow lakes you might have done this in o-level geography uh, or gcse whatever uh, and abandoned streamlines that have still got some some water in them perhaps but the river used to be over here and it's worked its way across so this looks like it's been scrubbed out and reworked and that's exactly what's happened and it's f flowing through a very um, desert area so if we zoom out a little bit you get the context of this Senegal River in its stream bed and moving across this floodplain uh, seasonally creating a new course every year 
and this over here where you can see the patterns from the way that this meander has developed. Originally it was small, it's got bigger and bigger and bigger and eventually this is going to close the loop here and that will get abandoned like this one over here. This is the Okavango Delta in Botswana and uh, it really makes a bit more sense if we zoom out. The Okavango Delta isn't a delta running into an ocean, it's a delta because it runs down into a very flat uh, area of, uh, of land, very low-lying area, and all the water, flood water, seasonal flood water, comes rushing down into that area and spreads out every year. Spreads out in a different pattern. So this is where it's spread out in previous seasons. Where the bright red is, is the current area where there's a lot of vegetation. It's bringing life, the water's bringing life to an arid area. Uh, oh, and these little white things are clouds and you can see shadows under each cloud. Okay, so there's a cloud and there's its associated me and my shadow. Lovely texture in that. I could look at that for hours. Different scale here. Um, anyone like to guess? No? Not the Lake District, no. No, good one. It's, um, it's the Grand Canyon. It's the Grand Canyon. It's a part of the Grand Canyon. Uh, and what I really like about this is the... And this is true colour. OK, so vegetation is green here. OK, this is the Kaibab Plateau, which is higher land. This is Arizona, very dry and deserty. As you go higher, there's more moisture available. And this is Ponderosa Pine Forest. But here, along the course of the, of, the, of the Colorado River, and then its tributaries coming in. And what I like about this is, uh, what is, I think is really appealing, is the self-similarity of the wiggles here with the wiggles in the tributary and then in the little tributaries. This, in nature, is called fractal geometry. And snowflakes have got fractal geometry. If if you've seen a picture of a snowflake, lots of things have got fractal geometry. And it's something that we humans find intensely attractive just, just because something looks the same at different scales. So there's lots of mathematics in nature. And this is one of those times when mathematics leads to a, a beautiful uh, result. Uh, off the coast of West Africa, uh, Guinea-Bissau, is this island called Bisargos. And uh, now we're getting quite intense with the vegetation. And um, you've got interaction of, really, it's sea and land. You'll see it when I zoom out. Look at that. It's like a tree. It really looks like a tree against the sky, like you're looking up into the sky. Until you look down here, and then you can see it's running out. It's actually a, a river running out into the ocean. There's evidence of a road and some settlement here, but apart from that, there's, I've shown you very little of humans in the landscape so far. None here either. This is seeing a, a, an estuary through seawater. Now the seawater absorbs red and green light and doesn't, it doesn't get to the bottom and reflect back, but blue light can go a long way through seawater. So it bounces off the bottom and comes back to the satellite. So that's why it has this blue cast all the way across it, apart from up here where this is very shallow. So you're getting the whole white light spectrum being reflected back equally from the silts here, which are shallow. Here it's deep and in between it's picking out what happens when you interact silt and currents together. And it's absolutely beautiful. You've got so many different, what appear like folds, but actually the, it's a shadow ridges. And here, these look like the waves that, when a wave comes up the beach and leaves the ripples behind, it's the same sort of thing, but underwater. Some fantastic textures in this, in this image. Um, this is wolf volcano in the Galapagos. It's uh, not called that because this looks like a wolf. I think it looks more like a seahorse. Um, it was studied by a Dr. Wolf, so that's why it's called wolf volcano. 
The thing that attracted me to this is this gradation in the vegetation. Again, this is true colour from lush vegetation higher up the volcano where it's catching more water to the edge where it's, it's more wet, drier. So the vegetation, there's less vegetation. But I absolutely love this green gradient here. That really catches my eye. A different volcano, different effect here. Humans in the landscape. This is all farmland until you get to the safe zone for the volcano, which is why nobody's farming in here in case this thing blows off, right? Uh, so th this is the edge of the danger zone. Uh, it's Mount Egmont in New Zealand. Oh, missed one. Isselmere in the Netherlands, full human interaction in the landscape, wouldn't exist unless they'd created the polders had actually uh, turned the sea into land over hundreds of years. And to me, this looks like a, a wonderful mosaic, um, a ceramic mosaic. You know, you could have that in your bathroom. That would be really quite nice, wouldn't it? But there's a town here. And these are little roads going out. And there's little farms here. It's like toy land, isn't it? And then all of, their, all of the fields for each of the farm, all very neat and Dutch. They're very good at neat, aren't they, the Dutch? <coughs> and here, almost finally, anyone know? Not you, because I told you. Norfolk. Norfolk? Well, actually, you're quite close. I've been on a world tour. We are coming closer to home. Anyone? Anyone? Well, if I told you this was the A303, what would this be? Stonehenge. Yeah, Stonehenge. Yeah, so this is Stonehenge. And uh, what's fantastic about this, we're in Oxford, so I can use a posh word. It's a palimpsest. So what you see are the old barrows and structures, all these earthworks here, all of these earthworks, loads of them, all around here. And they've gradually been ploughed out over the years. So it's a palimpsest because the, the current agriculture very largely is eliminating the previous works of man on the landscape. But there's still a little bit of evidence of that. Um, it's such a beautiful picture because of the patchwork of fields, because of the, the gentleness of the colours, the gentleness of the contours as well. You know, you want to sort of use it as a duvet, don't you, really? Maybe I'm a bit weird, I don't know. But yeah, it's really pleasant to look at. OK, so final one. Um, you don't have to be an EastEnders fan to know <laughs> what this is. And this wasn't taken from uh, a, a, an automatic satellite at 800 kilometres. This was taken from the International Space Station by a real astronaut using a great big telephoto lens looking out of the window. Obviously, they don't open the window, but uh, looking out of the window, it's called the cupola on the International Space Station. And it's got special optical glass to avoid distortions, and they can take fantastic pictures with a normal camera. So this is true colour of London at night, and you get this sense of the power, the pulsing power of the city in these veins that are kind of feeding it with, with uh, people and money and goods and whatever. So the living heart of the city and the intensity of the light varies. I'm running out of time. Um, yeah, so I won't say any more about this apart from the way the Roman roads, uh, this, is, um, da um, this is Ermine Street, yeah. Um, and the road to Dover, the Roman roads are still there. In, in the, they haven't been obliterated by development, unlike the Stonehenge surrounding landscape, which is being, has been removed. Mm, yeah. OK, so let's go back to what makes an image beautiful. I've, quite a few of these we covered. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure I'm not going to go through them all um, in detail. But one thing I want to say is that uh, what I haven't done is combine bad weather and a sense of scale. And when you do this in space, what you get is much more than beauty. You get uh, awesomeness. Now, this is a highly overused word in the current world, in the internet world, in the Twitter world, awesomeness is overused. But my contention here 
Absolutely not, because I'm going to show you something that which is awe-inspiring, and therefore awesomeness. First of all, I have to give you the scale measure. And this is about living with a star, our sun, and the terrible beauty of the sun when you get a look at it. So, this isn't the terrible beauty bit. This is a normal picture of the sun with some sunspots, quite active in fact, which move across the surface of the sun. Here's a blow up of these. And just for context, the Earth would fit very easily into that sunspot, okay? Into that one. So you know how big the sun is, okay? Think of that in what I'm going to show you now, which is a movie of the sun's greatest hits. Five years of the sun's greatest hits from the Solar Dynamics Observatory. And the detectors on SDO were built uh, up the road at the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory, just so you know. I'm going to shut up and let you watch it. That's Venus transiting across the face of the sun. Ultraviolet filters are being used here. This is the sun in ultraviolet. Okay, so um, big news, the sun's on fire, okay? Uh, don't worry though, that's really relatively normal solar behaviour. It's not that it's uh, sort of suddenly going to explode and we're, we're going to be in trouble. It's just that we're unaware most of the time of all of that activity going on on this star that, uh, that gives us life, but which is also incredibly active. Um, so, all of that stuff coming off the sun goes out into space, it's called the solar wind, it whizzes out at um, 300 kilometres a second when it's quite going quite slowly, and when it's going faster it can be uh, 1,000 kilometres a second. Now, that's been whizzing out from the sun for, uh, well, ever since it formed, and that's what took the atmosphere off the Earth, uh, off, off Mars. And the reason it hasn't taken it off the Earth is because we've got a magnetic field, which I'll come back to. Uh, I just want to show you the fragile beauty of our Earth in contrast to that. This is a very short movie of time-lapse of photographs taken from the International Space Station at 400 kilometers uh, during the night. This is lightning under the clouds, you're looking down, the lightning is beneath the clouds. These are city lights. This is the atmosphere. Oh, these are the solar arrays on the ISS, by the way, they just get in the shot. So that's the atmosphere, that's everything that's keeping us safe and keeping us alive on this planet. Here's Italy, blink or you'll miss it. We're going across Greece now, 
Here is Cyprus coming up in the Mediterranean. We're going out over the Arabian Peninsula. There's the Red Sea over there. And we're down now, not in the Northern Lights. This is the Aurora Australis, the Southern Lights. And this is the interaction of the solar wind with our, the top of our atmosphere. It's like a fluorescent light show. And fluorescent lights, those are, are plasma, that's plasma. And this is plasma in, the, in a, the top of our atmosphere, discharging billions of volts, huge energy to make this light show. Okay, so um, I'll, time's run out. So finally, magnetic field. You remember doing that experiment at school with, with a piece of paper and a magnet underneath and putting iron filings? And just think about that. So um, that's a way of seeing something that we can't see using the iron filings as a tracer. So we can do the same, funnily enough, uh, in the Milky Way. Here's a picture of the Milky Way taken by a telescope which is operating at the moment. It's going to measure the nearest um, billion stars in our galaxy. It's not finished the job yet, which is what these gaps are. This is the first two million, okay? Uh, it's a telescope that we built and was launched um, 18 months ago, and it's done it. this is the first release of the data after a year of operation. Now, this is just for context. This is the Milky Way, the thing that on a really good night you can go out, look up, and you see that band of light. That's the Milky Way. Um, and I'm going to now sprinkle uh, iron filings across the surface here and watch carefully. This image is made using... Uh, a microwave imager called on the Planck telescope. It's not Planck as in a piece of wood, Planck after the scientist. And uh, what it's doing is measuring the orientation of dust grains in the Milky Way, space dust. Because they orient towards the magnetic field in the Milky Way. So this is a map of the magnetic field in the Milky Way as given to us by observing space dust. Now I started with an image of dust and as you may know, dust is what stars and planets and in a sense we are all created from. So I think that's a good place to finish. Thanks very much. Okay, so, any questions? <laughs> <laughs> and um, I've, I've put some up there because I, I, that was quite a soft presentation about space. There's lots of controversial things about space and some of the controversial things, a whole range of them I've had to think about and I've put them up there. And if you want to lay in, please do, you know. Knock me out. Yes, hello. Is it an urban myth that we, in our um, telephones have got more computerised um, you know, ability than the, what they went to the moon in? Uh, no, it's not an urban myth by any means. You have so much. So the question was, sorry for the benefit of the recording, uh, is it an urban myth that the computer power in a phone is, uh, is much greater than they had for the Apollo missions? Not at all. The Apollo missions were carrying uh, less computer power than was in a Sinclair spectrum, if you remember those. So what you have these days is an incredible processor that is, is far more powerful than the first home computers in, in your phone. Well, I wouldn't go to the moon now, okay. frankly. I think it's a dangerous place to go, but there are plans to go back to the moon, and we will, in uh, the agents, the space agencies of the world, are getting together to return to the moon and try and live on the moon. Now, the f <laughs> don't get me started on this, but the, uh, the oh, I am the astronauts, <laughs> the Apollo astronauts spent only a few days on the moon. They were there during the lunar day. All right, the lunar day. Uh, is uh, 14 days. The lunar night is 14 days. The lunar night, it gets down to minus 100 centigrade, really cold. 
Uh, okay, really, really cold. So how do you survive that kind of length of time uh, in the night? There are parts of the moon on the South Pole called the Peaks of Eternal Light where you could put people and, and keep a habitation there and it would receive solar energy and you wouldn't get so cold. But going back to the moon and living there is going to be really difficult. Going and visiting for a short time is doable. Mm. But the computer power they had was, was absolutely limited. A lot of the control was done from the ground. They sent data back to the ground. It, people got their slide rules out and ran computers on the ground to run the trajectories and send the information and commands back in a sense, and, and the, the Apollo astronauts did say this themselves, that they were sort of like trained monkeys, really. I mean, they, they weren't in control of the, of the spacecraft. It was really being controlled for them because they didn't have the computing power to do some of the things they needed to do. Do you ever get satellites back? Uh, not usually, no. They, normally, when... The, yeah, those 1,500 satellites that are in operation around the Earth at the moment, there are, there are two classes. There are the ones that are a long way away, the geostationary ones. Uh, it's taken a lot of energy to get them out to that distance. And at the end of their life, and they normally have a 15-year life, the life ends when the fuel runs out, actually, to keep them on station. At the end of that time, they have enough fuel to go to what's called a graveyard orbit, which is 2,000 kilometres higher than, that, than the geostationary orbit. And they stay there. Uh, there's a lot of room up there, I must say, so uh, that's not really a problem. What is a problem is dead satellites in low Earth orbit, 800 kilometres, that sort of height. Um, satellites will eventually re-enter the Earth and burn up, and um, every day for the last um, 40 years, a satellite has re-entered the atmosphere and burnt up. Now, that might sound very wasteful and maybe even polluting, but... Um, there is tons of material from meteorites entering the atmosphere and burning up every day. Um, so relative to that, it's quite small. But returning satellites, the only time that that happens is when it's intended, that is to send a satellite to get a sample from an asteroid and then bring it back to Earth. It's very, very difficult to safely return something to the surface of the Earth. So I'm afraid satellites are on, a, most of them are on a one-way trip and that they are then disposed of at end of life. It is true that the governments of the world have made a terrible mess of space up till now. Uh, they didn't think about disposal, what we call post-mission disposal now. And now post-mission disposal is a very big issue and it is being sorted. There are rules about disposing of satellites so they're not going to cause problems and pollute the, that very precious ring around the Earth or shell around the Earth that satellites orbit in. So the supposed method is to get beyond that, not well, that? Well, no, it's better to, in the low ones, it's better to let them burn up in the atmosphere, get rid of them. They're, they used to think it was OK to boost them to 2,000 kilometres, but that, the rules have been changed recently to say low Earth orbit satellites, they don't launch unless they've got a deorbit plan at end of life. The problem is there's a load of stuff up there that isn't going to re-enter for hundreds of years. If it's above 500 kilometres, it'll stay there for decades. If it's above 1,000 kilometres, it'll never come back. It'll stay orbiting the Earth. And that's a problem because uh, it's very expensive to send a mission up to grab something and then dispose of it. We are working on that. We've developed harpoons and nets and various things uh, to, to do this, but nobody has yet captured another satellite except in a Bond movie and, <laughs> and, brought, it, and brought it down into the atmosphere to, to burn up. Uh, we know how to do it. We've analysed it. Nobody's willing to pay at the moment, but that is probably going to change in the next few years because it's going to become very important to get one or two really big, uh, dangerous satellites out of Earth orbit and, and get rid of them, effectively. And the expedition that you just started, were you involved in that? I, I was in the... Alexandra came to visit us in Stevenage, uh, uh, along with Emma and with, uh, with Sarah, uh, and I showed her what we do and it helped to inform her work, yes. But I didn't... I didn't get the Sharpie out and I didn't do any colouring in, no, no. Yeah, so, so behind, yeah. I was really interested to see the 3D printing. Um, yes. And I was curious how much of a satellite you can now build using a 3D printer, and does it make it 
theoretically cheaper because in art and design we've seen 3D printing being able to produce other objects that would be cheaper um, now that they've developed and become more of a sort of mass production object. So mm. could satellites theory theoretically be cheaper um, to produce with 3D printing? Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that is um, lighter and um, uh, it's stronger, but I wouldn't say at the moment it's cheaper because it takes a very long time. Have you seen how uh, that's a, that's not that's a metallic sintered 3D? So there's a very fine layer of powder put down, and a laser goes over the surface, and then another layer is put down, and a laser goes over the surface, which burns the powder, sinters individual grains of powder together and it, it doesn't burn in between and then when it's finished you clear away all the powder and the thing is there Ta -da! that's how it works and it takes ages to make one of those with at the moment technology is moving along uh, we are looking at 3d printing in space funnily enough mm, yeah yeah that's not a secret is it no <laughs> <laughs> 3d printing in space because you can, uh, you're constrained by the rocket fairing, the launch of fairing, which is to protect your satellite. When you launch it, it's going pretty fast through the atmosphere and it gets pretty hot. The launch of fairing protects what you're launching from that. The launch of fairing, like on a motorbike, the, 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 the windshield, when it's the same, a launcher has, you know, the pointy bit on the top of a launcher is to protect the payload inside. So. The size of that is carefully worked out to make sure that it can punch through the atmosphere eff efficiently. It's that size for a reason. You therefore can't launch anything that is bigger than the launcher fairing. The telescope that's going to replace the, the Hubble Space Telescope called the James Webb Space Telescope opens out, unfolds, and it's huge. But that, you know, you're really constrained by what you can fit inside the launcher. So, if you can take a 3D printer and the material, you can start making in space really big, long structures. And those uh, big, long structures are very useful for all sorts of different reasons. Again, that's another, that's another long talk. Yes? Um, there's two things from the visit that we'd yes. like to hear more about. One's the international collaboration, and the other is the Mars rover and what you're doing to do OK. Um, international collaboration. Well, I'm. Uh, at one level, Airbus is an international company, so we've got sites in Stevenage and Portsmouth and all over Europe, in Toulouse, in Friedrichshafen, in Toulouse, in France, Friedrichshafen, in Germany, in Bremen, in Germany, um, and sorry, satellite technology also in Guildford. So it's a very international company. The satellite, the telecommunications satellite I showed you at the beginning, the structure for that and the propulsion system is built in Guildford. It's then shipped down to Portsmouth. The, um, the, uh, the payload, which is the, the, the radio part, is fitted on the top. It's very big. And then that is sent down to Toulouse, where the satellite is finished off. The solar arrays are added. They're made in the Netherlands. And then the whole thing is, when it's finished and tested, is shipped down to Kourou in French Guiana where it's launched from near the equator, because if you're going out to geostationary orbit, it makes a lot of sense to send your launcher from near the equator than, than up here. So that's very international. The other thing is science missions. If they're European Space Agency missions, the European Space Agency has 25, I can't quite remember, I think 25 or more member states. They're not the same as, it's not a European Union, okay? European Space Agency members. Uh, it's not the same as the European Union, and, and UK is going to stay a member of the European Space Agency. Every science mission has contributions from all of the member states, both for the building of the, of the, of the spacecraft and also for the instruments, which come from scientific institutes in Oxford, in Swansea, that um, infrared image I showed you of the pillars of, crea of, the pillars of creation, of the Eagle Nebula, uh, that was uh, taken by an instrument called Spire, and the principal investigator for Spire is at Cardiff University. Fantastic. Um, so it's a really international uh, endeavour um, uh, with scientists collaborating 
not just in Europe for European space missions, but also with scientists all around the world. And um, you wanted to hear about the rover as well. So yes, in Stevenage we're building a Mars rover which will drill two metres below the surface of Mars. Um, that should be launched, all being well, in 2020. It's been a long time coming. When I joined what is now Airbus in, in 2006, that project was starting. So just to give you an idea, it takes a very long time to get a, a Mars rover off the ground, but hopefully it'll be launched in 2020. It will land in 2021, um, safely in 2021, and it will roll off and do its work. It won't send samples back home. It's incredibly expensive to do a Mars sample return mission, but what it will do is drill down the surface, take samples from as far down as it can get, bring them back up and put them into an analytical lab, which the, is inside the rover, and it will, that lab will do tests on the samples, which have been designed by some incredibly clever scientists to miniaturise all, essentially, a whole um, biogeochemical lab into, uh, you know, a form factor like this, and, and to send the results back to us. Some of the people who have contributed to that include the Open University, who make mass spectrometers. You may have heard of Colin Pillinger, who was there, uh, who sadly died a couple of years ago. But um, uh, that lab in the Open University, they make these mass spectrometers, and there'll be one of those on inside. And that can measure the chemical constituents of the samples. And what they're looking for is <coughs> organics. And if they find certain sorts of organics, then that will be evidence that there was past life, or even present life. The surface of Mars has been sterilised, as I said, by UV and by, by um, uh, also high energy particle radiation. So that we do, don't ever expect to find any signs of life uh, on the surface of Mars. But there is chance that because there was water on Mars, there will be evidence of it in rock layers that are beneath the surface, if you go to the right place. I mean, look at all those images I showed you of the Earth, and a lot of them didn't show signs of life from space, at least. So, you know, it's very important to decide where you're going to go and where you're going to drill. So that rover has been a long time uh, in development. It's quite a clever rover. It's got a vision-based navigation system. It's very difficult to control a rover on the surface of Mars. It takes a long time to send commands to Mars and get information back. The round trip time varies, but rough, it depends how far Mars is away from us. But uh, it can easily be 40 minutes round trip, and then you have to add in that it actually it's more than that because you're waiting for a relay satellite orbiting Mars to get the data from the rover, send that back to Earth, which will take 20 minutes, get the data, analyse it, which will be a picture of, I'm here, what do you want me to do next? People on the ground <coughs> write the set of commands, maybe rehearse it with a rover on the ground if it's in a very difficult position, and tell it what to do next. And they send that information back, then the rover rolls forward another six centimetres, right? <laughs> So it takes a very, very, because you don't want to lose your billion euro pound asset by running into a sandpit or off the edge of a cliff accidentally. So, but we've developed a vision-based navigation system that will allow the rover, without sending information back, to run at about 100 metres or more in a single shot, because it will have the ability to navigate between the rocks. Now, it's not like self-driving cars where you've got a structured environment, which is a road. You've got a very unstructured environment with rocks that would cause a big problem if you tried to get over them or you ran on top of them and then you ended up sort of wobbling on top with all your wheels off the ground. You know, that would not be a good day on Mars, would it? So um, the, um, the vision-based nav system and the avionics, uh, the, all, of the, all of the intelligence uh, in there has got to be um, has been developed. Um, and by the way, the computer system that is used is uh, a radiation hard one, and it's not as smart as your smartphone in your pocket, because the uh, high-speed radiation hard computing devices don't exist. So we're back to the equivalent of an IBM Pentium PC from about six years ago. Right. We don't, but 
we don't, but you can't take a whole oil rig thing yeah. and go right down. That, mm. I, that's a result of a lot of, of geological, Mars geological scientists yeah. trying to work out would it, would it actually yield anything. Yeah. I'm sure there's been a lot of debate. It's not my area of speciality, no. You've got me there. <laughs> yes? Um, something that I find really fascinating is the way that we use, um, well, the same techniques that we use here to study the Earth are then also used to study the planets in space. So things like weather systems, obviously the Mars rover, which uh, yeah, kind of, it sounds to me a little bit like kind of um, astrogeology or astroarchaeology, if you like. Um, absolutely. Um, are there any techniques that have been developed specifically um, for space in the first instance that we've then brought back to the Earth? Hmm. I think, yeah, that's a really tough question. Uh, thinking about it, I think plasma physics is an interesting one. Um, on Earth, plasmas don't exist. There are four states of matter, right? Solid, liquid, gas, and plasma. And a, um, a gas is a a plasma is a kind of dissociated gas in which the atoms have been split apart, so it consists of charged particles in, in, a, in a loose space. But in, in that tube up there is a plasma, right? That's, that's, uh, that's um, charged particles, okay? Uh, using a gas that will easily ionize, that is split out into ions, into its separate uh, atomic elements, essentially. So, um, an ionized gas is plasma, is the most abundant thing in the universe, but we have very little of it on Earth. And by studying um, uh, the magnetosphere around us, we have learned an awful lot about plasmas. And this feeds into fusion reaction and fission reactions on Earth, which in nuclear power stations and so on, understanding whether or not we'll be able to have fusion requires plasma physics. So, you know, those two things link up, studying plasmas in space and uh, in huge um, systems like, you know, the, the star forming systems that I was showing you at the beginning. Um, the study of plasmas in those feeds back into the study of plasma physics on Earth. That's one example I can think of. I can't think of any others. There must be. Yes. I just was wondering, with all these wonderful missions to explore space, is there partly, sort of very subconsciously in the back, a reason is, I mean, we know that the sun will run out of fuel. I know it's a long time away, but it will happen. And this is partly, I don't know about the scientists looking ahead, looking if that happens. We obviously can't live on this earth. Here, so well. Will, is this partly to do with, is there anywhere else we can actually go? Hmm, so, um, have we got a backup? Yeah, plan, hmm. plan B. <laughs> plan B. My personal view, I don't believe in plan B. I think it's a stupid idea, absolutely, because I know how difficult it is to get to the moon, I know how difficult it is to get to Mars, and how difficult it would be to establish a colony on Mars. There are other people, uh, some of them who are much cleverer than me, Stephen Hawking being one of them, who thinks that we should have a backup. Um, and there's a guy in America called Elon Musk uh, who strongly believes that and who it has got a vision for establishing a colony on Mars of a million people. And he's got a plan for doing it. I think it's a very, very long shot. Uh, he wowed the International Astronautical Federation last year in Mexico by giving a presentation about how we were going to live off planet. And I've looked in detail at the presentation he gave and some of the documents. And the technology of what he presented is probably doable, but he's neglected a number of things which are really, really important and really difficult problems. And the biggest one um, is radiation in space. We can have astronauts on the International Space Station uh, surviving for six months a year, and they're okay. Astronauts, by the way, when they come back, 
doctors are all over them because they want to see how they've changed. And they have changed. They lose bone density from the gravity. But they also get radiated. Um, Tim Peake, our British astronaut, Major Tim, um, will tell of at night closing his eyes and seeing lights because charged particles are passing through his body and when they pass through his eyeball they leave a track like in a particle detector in, in CERN where they have these particle detectors in the accelerator. His eye becomes a particle detector and he would see light tracks moving across his eye. <laughs> now. No, not now. In when he was on the ISS. Not now. We are protected on Earth uh, because of our atmosphere and because of our magnetosphere, like I mentioned. Now, if you go beyond the magnetosphere, which you have to do to go to Mars, uh, and your minimum journey is six months, the chance of getting a very severe radiation event from the sun is 100% including radiation events that would make you very sick within hours. Now, people talk about radiation shielding, but radiation shielding is a tricky business. I'm actually looking at a method of radiation shielding which would change all of this completely, but I can't tell you anything about it <laughs> at all. Seriously. Yeah, time-wise, I think we're probably... How are we doing? We... Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now we've got some time. I, yeah. um, satellites that are looking outwards, are, are, are they looking to try and tell us anything about dark, dark matter? Yes. Right. Yeah. Um, dark energy and dark matter. Yes, um, I'm, I'm a humble geography degree and, and what I really like is that physicists have got 5% on their grad papers because they can only explain 5% of the matter in the universe. 95% of the matter is unaccounted for and it consists of dark matter and dark energy according to their calculations but they have absolutely no idea what dark matter and dark energy they made it up basically <laughs> when they did their accounting they said gosh we can only account for 5% we are made of stuff called baryonic matter right we have all the atoms and molecules and stuff are baryons because uh, you could detect them with electromagnetic radiation. So when we sent, when we use telescopes to look at the stars and the planets and, and all of that stuff, we are detecting only baryonic matter. The rest of it, so-called dark matter, we can't detect, but we think it's there. There is a way that you can because it has gravity. Dark matter has got gravity. So if you look over across the universe, very, very long distances, and you take samples of galaxies, the light that's come from those distant galaxies has been bent, changed, by passing through the dark matter. And we know that this is true. So there is a mission called Euclid, which is going to map the whole sky and look at all of the galaxies very, very oh, from near to far, and by looking at statistical samples of galaxy shapes, you can work out how the light from those galaxies, even we, though we don't know what their true shapes are, statistically you can work out how the light has been distorted by the intervening mass of dark matter. It's got mass, but we can't measure mass directly. So this is a bit like measuring that magnetic field by an indirect method. It's the same sort of thing. So there is a mission called Euclid, which is going to try, by measuring the shapes of galaxies and doing a whole sky survey, uh, to do that. We're building that mission, and the instruments are being built by groups of scientists all around Europe, including at Mullard Science Laboratory in University College London. So yes, we're trying to, trying to do that. But I can't tell you much more about it, because I don't really understand that stuff. It's really hard. <laughs> you say your work takes you five or ten years ahead. How far ahead are we looking until we sort of understand that? Um, oh, I, I really can't comment on that. It's completely outside my expertise, I would say. That's, that's really hard physics, and I'm not, I'm not a physicist, so... Uh, uh, yeah. Um, scientists who I've heard talking about it, eminent scientists say they really don't understand dark matter, they don't, or dark energy, and they, they, uh, they're they very vague about it. They should be very embarrassed. <laughs>
yes, you can get the pictures. Uh, there is a, a, a PDF file with all the links to everything that I showed you. Almost everything is public domain. Uh, all of those movies you can get on the internet. The, the space station one of night, that's available as a YouTube. You can, the links are all there in a document that uh, will be mailed out. Yeah, so everybody registered. You'll get an email with a PDF document. And if you click on the links, that will take you to the pictures, or at least resource of the pictures. Uh, yeah. How are we doing? Yes? Do you believe that humans will only travel beyond our solar system? No. Is it possible? No. It's huge. It's, uh, unless we discover wormhole travel or something. I mean, we are... We are Doctor Who, yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. I mean, we are, in, in advanced systems, we are not even working on that, okay? I mean, it's just off the scale. We're not, not doing that kind of stuff. Uh, the people have looked at this and worked out that maybe if you had a nuclear thermal rocket, so this is making a huge reactor and, and putting that into a, a, into a spacecraft that you launch off Earth. Nobody's very keen on launching reactors into space for some reason. I can't think why. <laughs> but uh, uh, <laughs> but there's a lot of practical problems to going really, really, really fast. I mean, just the scales of the solar system are, are enormous. Voyager was launched, uh, you know, when was it? 19... I've forgotten. 70-something. And it, only a couple of years ago, it got to the edge of the solar system, right? So it's been traveling for you know, 40 years to get to the edge of the solar system. Um, so, you know, you'd have to be able to procreate if you were going to send humans beyond. People have studied it. It's appeared in science fiction, or which is close to real science. There are science fiction writers who've written about it. Nobody's seriously looking at it, though. I mean, it's stuff of fantasies. Um, propulsion technology is still basically chemical propulsion to go very fast. And a rocket to get off Earth and go into orbit has got to go about seven and a half kilometers a second. That's really, really fast. That's Mach 25, right? A jet plane travels at Mach 3. That's a really fast fighter jet, goes at Mach 3. Uh, that's faster than a bullet. So Mach 25 is ridiculous. Uh, ridiculously fast and we can do that with a massive great big chemical rocket the same sort of technology that Werner von Braun invented to throw V2s at us in the Second World War and we haven't really got any further of course it's been refined but it's the same basic technology there is a company called Reaction Engines Limited in in uh, in this country who are looking at uh, a, a, a different sort of propulsion system that can air breathe during the uh, launch from Earth and then turn into a, a chemical rocket above. And that will be a game changer, but it would still not unlock access to the edge of the solar system. You would really need to go an awful lot faster um, to be able to do that. Another technology is solar sailing. If you could unfurl a massive sail, really massive sail and catch the solar wind, which is very weak, but is blowing all the time. If you could catch the wind, you could, in theory, sail out <laughs> to the edge of the solar system. No, seriously, because you've got these particles hitting your sail all the time, and eventually you'd build up such a speed, you would get really fast, but it would take a very long time. So people have looked at ideas like that, but nothing, there's nothing really realistic on the drawing board to get out. Uh, even, you know, humans to Mars is really hard. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>